Good morning. Welcome from Melbourne. My name is Michael Biviano. Welcome to Life, Love and the Pursuit of Real Estate. Again, I'm blessed to have my friend here, Travis Fulton from Lanton Capital. Our last video, which we did, I think, approximately two weeks ago, John, yep. give or take, uh, went really, really well uh, and was um, very, very uh, uh, well responded to in relation to comments back, etc. So they found Travis really informative, um, as I always do. Uh, aside from our social outings, right? And um, today we thought we'd cover a few new topics and maybe regurgitate maybe one of the old topics. And we wanted to talk about, you know, APRA and banking, you know, maybe a little bit on the Australian uh, economic outlook. We want to talk about property development funding and how Travis is experiencing uh, that. Um, and we're just going to talk about the, the residential home loan market and the effect that that's having on people buying. So, mate, again, welcome. Thanks very much for coming, buddy. No problem. No problems. Good on you. Pleasure to be here. Um, okay, let's talk about APRA. Yep. Right, and and banking and the effect on that. Maybe what we'll do after that too is I want to cover this um, NAB Australian Wellbeing. Yeah. 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 And we'll have a, we're both yeah. laughing at that, but we'll we'll, we'll cover that in, in detail in a minute. But yeah, no so let's talk about APRA. Tell us, tell us the APRA seem to have raised their head recently more mm -hmm. and they're more in the public eye than they have ever been before. Do you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So two questions. Why is that and yeah. what effect are they having on the banks? Yeah, sure. And with APRA, um, the Australian Prudential Reg Regulation Authority, yeah. they act uh, very, very independently. Um, they're sort of uh, a law unto themselves right. uh, and they're, they're completely separate to ASIC. Uh, completely separate to the Reserve Bank, and they are obviously a government department, um, but they have a, a mandate and a mantra. Um, you know that's you know that's fairly sort of um, specific and, and sort of closed in. You know, so what's the mandate? Uh, really, to protect the Australian banks and the Australian economy, yep. um, and to ensure you know generally, and that's a pretty high level statement. But we don't get into a position. Um, like you know, a lot of the offshore banks did through the GFC. Right. Yes. Right. And it's a real strengthening of you know the I guess the financial economy and the financial stability of the banking system. Yep. And a lot of work's gone on, gone on like that around around the globe, and Australia sort of followed suit too. Albeit we were probably only one of the you know the four banks here stood up among the top ten. You know when the GFC hit, yep. um, but they certainly have tightened. But I think. I think their sort of main focus with the banks at the moment is just around um, household debt. And Australians got, as we spoke in the last um, last episode, we do have a very high level of household debt. Yes, agreed. Uh, and I think everyone... Money in some cases. Yeah, and yeah. I think everyone, APRA, the banks, you know, all, all the sort of stakeholders in this are quite concerned. Um, you know, interest rates are low uh, over the years. You know, loans and debt has been relatively easy to get hold of. Yep. Um, and now they're sort of concerned that if there is a sharp increase in interest rates, you know, globally, or there is a sharp turn in, you know, inflation or the, some of the other indicators that drive um, interest rates, yes. you know, the Australian, you know, the Australian economy is going to suffer at the at the cost of higher, higher cost of funds, higher interest rates. <coughs> And well, of course, the people with larger household debt are going to be affected yes. predominantly straight away. Yes, that's overnight. right. Yeah, and I think the level of sort of consumer spending and um, you know a couple of the other indicators around the consumer aren't that flash anyway. Confidence, retail spending, a whole range of other things. So if we have a rising interest rate environment, that's even going to make that worse, yeah. and there's going to be this drag on the economy. So you know, what I've seen, sorry to interrupt. Sure. What I've seen is this: when they talk about retail spending. And they talk about, um, you know, the amount of volumes of houses sold and what's needed, etc. One of the things, retail spending has been really tough, mm. as we've seen in a lot of the reports here in our local papers. But interestingly enough, people's household debt's gone up. Mm. So people have had a concentration on spending more money on their house than spending money on themselves. So it seems to be, to me, that there's more a concentration on, I'd rather live in a better house and go without some other things, yeah. then have the other things and live in a lesser house, true, which is true. a very different way of thinking to 30 years ago. 
isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it seems to me, yeah. right? Although the house, you know, and, and people aren't staying. What I've noticed is, you know, people like my parents that have been in their house for 40 years, mm. that doesn't happen anymore. Mm. A lot of that, people are changing and upgrading all the time. So there's a very different feel in the marketplace mm. with that. And I can understand APRA's hesitancy. Mm. So then, so... And there, sorry, yeah. Go, uh, so at a banking level, then what happens? Yeah, so what, what APRA are doing is, um, I guess they're sort of, you know the sort of weakness in you know the the sort of banking system and the start and the sort of tapering off of the housing market is partially driven by APRA regulation. Yeah, agree. Um, because and your you know your contacts in the real estate agent sort of industry might be seeing you know increased occurrences of sort of finance clauses going past. You know, they're due by date where it's fourteen twenty one, there seems to be extensions. I don't know if that's a factor. Yeah, the, well there's a lot of there's a lot of ex- what I've actually noticed in the real estate agents that I'm talking to in Perth, Sydney and Melbourne, the some of the real estate um, extensions, finance extensions, are actually double. Some of them are even tripling, especially if it's related to land. Mm. Because the banks seem very anti high LVRs on land only, as you yeah. know. Yeah. Well, as you've educated me too. Yeah. On that score they can blow out to six months. Yeah. Some of those finance clauses. Yeah. So that then that that erodes the ability of that business to be able to get the commission in mm. after the deposits released, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it stifles cash flow, stifles a whole range of different things. Yeah. So there's a whole lot of extenuating circumstances and factors that actually, by the time it permeates down, it affects the core level of the, uh, just a normal little sales business. Yeah. 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 And what and the banks policies on homelands to me seem to be changing weekly um, and there's a real shift and it, it appears there's a real tightening and a, I guess there's a lot more scrutiny and due diligence on you know banks finance brokers mortgage brokers yeah. when they're when they're processing a home loan even as far as down as sort of getting really granular on living expenses and hitting certain benchmarks they're, they're sort of analyzing bank statements credit card statements um, and and making it, yeah, really challenging for home loans to get through the system, and that's that's even on an owner occupied basis. So it's also on the investment side where banks are you know handing down haircuts on rental incomes. You know, so if you've got a you know if you've got an investment property and there's a rental income, they're shading that by sometimes thirty percent. I heard one bank in the market's actually now doing it by forty. Really, to give their safety barrier the buffer. That's a worry. Right. Um, and that's the first time I heard it go to 40. Um, maybe that's just that one bank, but generally it's around the 20. Yep. Um, so there's, yeah, like some banks will not do uh, LVRs past 80 on investment. Yeah. Some banks won't provide lenders mortgage insurance on investment at all. Well, it's um, right there, is it? Yeah. 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 So there's a real, okay. yeah. And I think. You know, with the with the reserve bank and interest rates, and you know other factors that can cool the housing market, I think APRA has also it's like a a regulatory cooling, right. you know, through how they're sort of putting this overlay over the banks on sort of more stringent, um, yeah, sort of policies that they they have to adopt. And just another quick one is, you know, a lot of a lot of people will hear that the banks when they're assessing a home loan don't. They don't use the actual rate of the day. They'll use a rate almost double what the rate is to stress that ability to for a consumer to service their oh, home loan. Oh, the analysis. Yeah. So let's okay. say the rate was yes. four. Some yeah. banks will assess their affordability at eight, and that's actually an APRA-driven requirement. So the bank, you know, I think sometimes um, consumers will look at the bank and blame the bank, but a lot of the time it's because that's what APRA have come over the top yes. and, and sort of stated. So if there is a crunch of some description, you know, and how material that is, I think APRA uh, want to be comfortable that if there is a correction or a major shock to the system, that consumers and banks are going to be right. well, here then, to fight another day. Well, see, then the reality of that is, like you and I have stated many times beforehand, it's the, well, then I used to say it was the guys at credit that used to determine a lot a lot of what happened in the marketplace, but it's actually the guys at APRA that, that give give the uh, fee to credit and then credit pass it on. We can only presume 
the, the tightening of this market is going to continue for a while. Yeah. Um, the, then that also beckons another question, property development finance. So we go into another level yeah. where you've got the property developers, if they're not a publicly listed company, like we're not, we're private, getting finance at high levels now is harder. Yep. Yeah. We've got to dance more, we've got to get through more hoops, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, they talk about Melbourne having a significant shortage here and across Australia of uh, housing. So therefore, I can only see that that, that sh shortage is not going to necessarily get sorted very quickly. And I can see that that may actually be a countermeasure to stabilising price. Mm. So mm. I, I think in Melbourne at the moment, I think we're predicted to go up about 2% this year yeah. in growth. Um, I think that's probably good. I think the only other uh, state that's like that is Perth. Mm -hmm. The rest are predicted to drop slowly. So when it comes to property development finance, what what advice do you give property developers like me in general? You know, the guy that's doing, say, two townhouses or the guy that's doing 200 houses, What are there any rules that you can sort of tell him or any processes that he can follow that make his job yeah. life a bit easier? Look, and the banks are still very open to development finance. Yes, it is. You know the criteria to get you know meaningful you know sort of win-win development finance is a lot harder the yeah. banks have certainly tightened uh, and i think primarily they're tightened because of a concern in the sort of inner city cbd apartment market right. uh, where there is heavy levels of comp concentration in some cities yes. you know for example here in melbourne if you're a developer and you had a site in city road south yarra the, the city uh, probably richmond um, the criteria for doing development in those areas is going to be a lot more stringent than, say, doing, you know, sort of, I don't know, 10 townhouses in, in the suburbs or, you know, medium density in right. the sort of the, the sort yes. of yep. 10k radius out. Yep. So it's sort of a bit of horses for courses. But I think at the end of the day, really, when you're approaching banks for development funding, it's just really getting them in as early as you possibly can, even at planning stage or before. Yeah. Um, and really trying to take them along for the journey. Well, that's a relationship thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, use, yeah, spend the money and sort of use good people around you, um, you know, in, in the consultants and the information that the banks are expecting um, and really trying to put in the work, you know, engage some others to help you along the way. Well, that's you know, relationships with your banker, a type yeah. of chip, your valuer, yeah. your builder, all your consultants, your engineers, your environmental people and all that, making sure you get them on tap early. Yeah. So therefore, you're running your business, therefore, ahead of the game, so to speak. So therefore, when the bank asks you for this, this, this and this, you give it to a proven Australia, that's yeah. what we've been doing. Okay. Yeah. And if you went to them with no environmentals or you didn't have any of that in play or hadn't even thought about those sort of things, you know, it just, it just makes it harder. Then you've got the bank running your development. Yes. Yeah, you know, that's not a good position to be. No, yeah, no. So, all right. Yeah, and just quickly on on development. I mean, just back on APRA, you know, they, they're also monitoring the exposure levels in the banks of development funding as well. And I've heard stories from banks where APRA is sitting in their offices in the banks, looking at you know their their development books, the the tail on pre sales, how much um, how much new stocks coming on coming onto the market, a whole range of analysis around. Um, those sort of things. So, at times, APRA are embedded in the property bankers on their floor. Wow. Okay. Looking at files and yeah, it's. it's well, that, that to me seems to indicate the fact that APRA and C are anticipating or are trying to avoid yeah. a strong correction. Yes. Or yeah. a large correction, yeah. let's say, for the want of a better term. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and it shouldn't be alarming. I think you're exactly right. It's more so, all right, well. Preventative. Yes. The that's corrective. right. Yeah. 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 Okay. So prevention is better than cure. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. All yeah. right. Okay. Well, I think we'll leave it at that. Um, hopefully, that's been some great information for you guys. I want to just end on a, um, a NAB report. Right, that Travis was <laughs> Travis brought to me this morning. So we want to end on a little bit of a humorous note. This is the what they call the NAB Wellbeing Report, quarter three for 2017. Right, so um, it, the NAB Wellbeing Index says that the Tasmanians are the happiest people that we've got in our country. 
I understand many reasons why that is. Uh, it also says that uh, people over 50 are pretty happy. Uh, it states here that uh, men and women are nearly equally as happy, yeah. right? Generally speaking. It says that uh, widowers are generally happier than married people. <laughs> I, I don't know what that. I don't know what that is the case, right? Uh, it also says that um, people with a household of two are happiest. So that means people with kids aren't happy at all. That's right. <laughs> and I think that's just two kids. If you got any more than two kids, you're, oh, you're not as happy. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, Miss Ford. Okay. Yeah, good. And the people with no children are really happy, right? And uh, the technical technical workers are generally happier than professional people, and the and this one I saw you already that the people that are unemployed are really bloody happy. So well, on that note, we'll end. I want to say thanks very much for listening. Thanks for supporting our channel. It's free to subscribe. We'll talk to you soon. God bless. Cheers.